Hi, this is Jan Kabili. Welcome to The Fix, the podcast that's all about Photoshop, Lightroom, and post-processing. In this episode of The Fix, I sit down with my friend Rick Salmon, the godfather of photography. Rick is doing workshops, writing books, taking photos, posting online. He is everywhere. And he's really a pleasure to talk to because he knows so much about shooting and post-processing. In this episode of The Fix, Rick will show us how he processes one of his photos in Photoshop using Camera Raw as a filter and then applying some plugins, some Nick Google plugins, Silver Effects Pro to convert to black and white, and Color Effects Pro 2. So stay tuned for this episode of The Fix with Rick Salmon. Hi, Rick Salmon. How are you today? I am so happy to uh, be here. You know, my wife watches your tutorials. I watch your tutorials. So many people I know watch your tutorials. You're an amazing uh, instructor, so it's really an honor to be here. Oh, that's so nice of you. Well, well you know, I mean, I... <laughs> Go ahead. I mean it. Well, so are you. And, you know, I have to tell you, Rick Salmon, it sure looks to me like you are some kind of photography machine. <laughs> I mean, you do it all. You're, what, you do workshops, lots of them. You write books, lots of them. You are constantly shooting and posting your photographs. Um, you play the guitar, I see, online. Oh, I love guitar, yep. I, I just moved them to my house, but I'm in the office now. Oh, well, that's too bad. I love guitars, too. Well, and, and you travel just all the time. So I, I need to know this. How, what is your motivation for all this? What keeps you going? Well, I think, uh, you know, just I love life. And my philosophy is if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. So every day I really, really try to have fun. I try, I try to make it fun. I try to make it fun for others. And I think photography uh, keeps us fun. Uh, being healthy um, keeps us young. You know, I'm 65 uh, next month. And wow. I, walk, I go for two walks a day. I just finished exercising with my, uh, with my exercise bands. Uh, you know, the Buddhists say... Uh, you know, learning is health, and being healthy is so important. So I really, really try to stay healthy. And I think all that stuff together, learning, being healthy, being excited, making it fun, keeps you uh, keeps you productive. Oh, I agree with you. And you know what they say, 60 is the new, what, 20? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, 60? I think 65 is the new 45, because seriously, I've never felt better. I've never felt more excited about life, about being a photographer. Don't you agree, like, with all the things we could do and Photoshop and Lightroom and all the plugins, it's just so much. You told me, Jane told me not to wave my hands because it freezes Google Plus. And being Italian, this is really hard for me. Not to I know, do. I know. Being Jewish, so. it's really hard for me. I have to stand <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> hey, maybe, we, maybe we could have a podcast. What's worse, Jewish guilt and, or, or Italian guilt? And I think, I think Italian guilt has it. <laughs> Oh, really? You're so, funny. You're so funny. Well, we'll talk about that. Some other. Okay. But today okay. we are going to, I would like to talk about sure. your new book. You've got a new photography book. How many books does this make for you? Well, this is, this is 36, Jim. That's unbelievable. Well, I, I, someone asked me how I could write so many books. I said, I type fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, show us. Where's the book? This is the book. It's called A Creative Visualization for Photographers. And it's actually one of my thickest books. And what's really interesting is, that for people who get it, they'll see it has a lot more text, a lot more text than some of my other books, because this is more like a, a textbook on learning. So creative visualization, you know, what is that? It's, you know, this is envisioning the end result. So, you know, I'm looking at the picture right behind you of the tree with the dark sky. When you looked at that picture, you, you I'm sure you envisioned the end result and the shadows and how to make... The exposure, and you probably also thought, since you're an expert in digital enhancements, what can I do, you know, to bring that out? So my guess is you envision the end result, and that's what this whole book is about: envisioning the end result. How we can, like in black and white, when we envision a black and white scene, and we we start to actually see in black and white. You know, we see that sky is black, and we see values rather than tones. Uh, when we see colors, we can see we can envision how they're going to reproduce either on on a flat book or like a reflected art or projected through a screen. So, and I also talk in here about the different levels of learning that we go through, the four levels of learning where we start. You know, we, we think we're good and we're not, and then the final level, the fourth level of learning is where we just do it like. Getting back to the music, you know, Carlos Santana just playing guitar. He's not really thinking about it. He's just doing it. And the same thing with Clapton. 
And same thing with Jimi Hendrix, who I saw the movie last night. Did you see the Jimi Hendrix movie? No. Oh, it's amazing. It's good. Is so it? anyway, it's, it's, um, it's actually in one of my, my, my favorite books. It includes my uh, favorite photographs. And uh, I think actually it's been, it's been, as we speak, it's been number one on Amazon for five weeks in a row. Oh, that's terrific. Do you still sell your books in the traditional bookstores, or they're mostly just buy them online? Well, uh, this is actually a PDF uh, is available. The printed version isn't even out yet. We're recording this on April 1st. It'll be out by April 17th. Uh, but I, I'm, I just did this ebook. It's called Get Motivated and Stay Inspired, and I'm selling this directly through my site on, on something called Content Shelf. Are you familiar with that? No. Content Shelf is amazing. Uh, it's like you know, like fourteen dollars a month, and you could for like a gigabyte, and you could put up your tutorials there. You could put up your eBooks. So I'm selling direct. People click, they download it, and it's very, very cool. Well, that's so good. I think it really makes it easier for more people to access all this great material. And um, you know, getting books online is a lot less expensive, and it just doesn't involve all that environmental problems of driving <laughs> books around to bookstores. I think it's terrific. Oh, yeah. Well, and now it's easy to create this new book that I'm talking about, Getting Motivated and Staying Inspired. It's a condensed version of my keynote slideshow, and I just did Convert to PDF, and that there I have my ebook. Ah, repurposing. <laughs> what, what could, what, well, not everyone can come and see me, you know, even though I give, like, more seminars, I think, than most people uh uh, most photographers give, except maybe Scott Kelby. <laughs> uh, well, you, you, and you also lead these great workshops, right? Well, I lead workshops, and my philosophy is this, that uh, people want to know how much you care before they care how much you know. Like, everybody knows what I know, right? I actually, when I worked in the advertising agency, I had this sign on my, oh, I waved my hands, had this sign on my desk uh, on the wall. And, you know, when I would hire people, that's what I said, how much do you care? Because a lot of people know the same thing. And, you know, they could come on a workshop and learn how to photograph horses or landscapes or HDR. Everybody knows how to do that, every pro. So I, I try to show people that I really care about them when they come on the workshop that we really care that they're going to, A, <laughs> get great pictures, B, have, uh, have a lot of fun, and uh, maybe C, make some lifelong friends and have good food. It sounds totally fun. Oh, and the good fun. food, of course. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, you know, you're doing so many things, and I know you also, um, I, but I want to talk about a little bit about what you do after you shoot and after you shoot with right. your uh, workshop um, students. I know you spend a lot of time processing. I do. Uh, tell us, what, are, are you a Photoshop guy, a Lightroom guy? What do you do? Well, I tell people, I, I teach Lightroom, and uh, but today I'm going to show you something in Photoshop. I say the day someone shows me how to do something in Lightroom that I can't do in Photoshop, <laughs> I'm going to switch. But I still love Photoshop. You know, like with this book, I had to convert every single file to a CMYK file. Can you do that in Lightroom? No. No. No, so because CMYK is for print. Right. So I, I had to do I, that, that. I do a lot of uh, a lot of other things with blending modes and luminosity masks. I know you could do some of the same thing, but I've been using I've been using Photoshop for so long, and you know Lightroom is totally totally amazing. And I think every instructor today has to know how to do do both, right? And oh, yeah. I, I'm sure you find this. What drives me crazy is people, and for some reason happens most with, mostly with people who have PC. I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard this, but if other instructors are listening, they've heard it. People download the pictures, and then I hear, like, while we're during the downloading session or the next day, Lightroom lost my pictures. Oh, of course. Well, that's course. because it's a different way of working than Photoshop. It involves a database, and that's hard for a lot of people to get their heads around. So that's our job, right? Or my job <laughs> is I try to simplify that for people. And once they get it, they're very happy using Lightroom. But you know, Rick, I, I am really a proponent of it is not Lightroom or Photoshop. They are complementary. Right. And um, you can't do everything you need to do in Lightroom, but it's certainly a great starting point. And then if you need to do the extra things... You take them to Photoshop. And I actually wrote a whole book about that, not to self-promote, but to just because I want to make sure people understand this, and it's a little complicated. I wrote one of those books behind me, the one that's kind of uh, the second one in there. It's a classroom in the book for Adobe, and it is all about that process of using Lightroom and Photoshop together and when to do it, not just how to do it. So it's a very interesting topic. I think you were on my podcast talking about that a while ago. 
I think if that's not, right. we're going to have you back again because, <laughs> because this is so important. And I actually want to have you back again because this is the thing. How can people blame Lightroom for, for losing their pictures? I never heard, oh, Bridge lost my pictures. <laughs> <laughs> right? you got to blame someone, right? <laughs> yeah, you got to blame someone. Let's get back to the Jewish and the Italian guilt. <laughs> You're so right? We, we blame our mothers. Well, anyway, so, so you, well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> But let me ask you this. So you are a Photoshop guy. Do you use plugins with Photoshop? I, I love using plugins. I feel that plugins can really help us awaken the artists within. Now, I'm sure you know this. Uh, every plugin out there, you could do the same thing that a plugin does if you're very skilled at Photoshop, but it might take you three hours, <laughs> you know, to do all the blending modes and the this and the that and, you know, or like detail extractor. Do you use a uh, Nick? The Nick software? I do. Well, Nick, Google software now. Oh, yeah, now it's that. With the ColorFX Pro, Jan, with the uh, detail extractor, I call that like HDR simulator because it somehow or other it opens the, the shadows without creating noise, which, as you know, is a big problem with opening up shadows. But, you know, that and the dark and light and center, which I might be using some of these during a demo, uh, and all the, like, the duplex filter I like and the topaz, spiceify. Well, I say spiceify. I think they say specify. Uh, the on one software is amazing. All these plugins, you know, see, I, I have time to do this. You know, I tell people that for me, as a travel photographer, it's probably 50-50. 50% 50 taking the picture, 50% image processing. Now, a wedding photographer is not going to think like that, right? Because you have to take 300 shots, he or she, 300 shots, and, you know, that's it. They don't have the time. But, uh, you know, Ruth Bernhardt, a wonderful photographer who I met, you know, you know of, she died, black and white photographer, and if your listeners want to be inspired by black and white, by and by a photographer, Ruth Bernhardt. Anyway, she had a wonderful expression. An expression is, you can't spend too much time working on a photograph because your soul is in the photograph. And, you know, not every photograph I take, you know, has my soul in it, but a lot of them do. And so I feel you can, you know, people say, oh, you spent 20 minutes working on that picture. You know, Ansel Adams spent weeks or months working on on these and Yosef Karsh, if you want to be inspired by uh, and probably the one of the best, most well known, although young kids today <laughs> don't know who he is, Karsh of Ottawa. He he did he was the Ansel Adams of portraiture. He did these beautiful black and white pictures that look luminescent, that they shine like Hemi I'm sure you've seen the picture of Hemingway with the sweater. That's a Karsh of Ottawa photograph. Well, it's interesting that you uh, bring up these other photographers because I do think that's a really important thing for everyone to do is look at the work of other photographers and not just um, the social, uh, if you want to call them the social media photographers, the people who, you know, that we interact with every day, but also uh, the historically uh, successful photographers like Ruth Bernhardt, like other black and white shooters from the old days because, you know, they really had to know about processing their photos. They had to get their hands dirty and they were in the chemicals doing it. So there's a lot to learn um, from looking at their work. I've looked and at also the their shooting, of course. I don't know if I can find it for you. I was looking for something. No, I can't find it right now. But you, you know, I think uh, some photographers today are more interested in being the social media stars than they are in the art and craft of photography. You know, and why? They get the million followers, and then they promote that they have the million followers all the time. You know? <laughs> you just, you know, promote photography, you know? Well, I don't think it's an either-or. I mean, they're both really fun and really wonderful pursuits. Um, but I do think that there is a lot to learn from the history of photography. And personally, I didn't know anything about it but until I had the great fortune by just serendipity to end up in a graduate program in photography and people started saying look at this photographer's work and that photographer's right. work and oh my god and I started to be able to see like a photographer yeah part by looking at other people's work and also in large part I'm sure you would agree by practicing right well did you read outliers by Malcolm Gladwell I haven't read it but I've seen it Outliers is, is a wonderful book to read. I recommend this to my students. And what Malcolm Gladwell talks about in the book is that, you know, people who are successful, like you say, like you just said, which reminded me of it, practicing. He talks about people who are, who are successful practice for 10,000 hours. And at 65, I probably practice for, <laughs> for 10,000 hours. But he talks about the Beatles. These guys practiced for so long before they got famous. Years in a basement. 
You're right, you're right. Well, you know, I think use it, particularly the processing part of photography is a lot like music. You have to learn a new instrument. Um, at first, it's unfamiliar, and you're kind of bumbling around. And the goal, ultimately, as you said, um, is to get to the stage where you don't have to think about it, where it's second nature, where your hands know where to go. At least you don't have to think about which, you know, the, the technique and uh, where the tools are in Photoshop. You just know. And then you can really use them. Well, you know, Jen, I relate music and photography like you just did, like, all the time. You know, someone says, how do I learn all the stuff in Lightroom, right? All the, the sliders and the pull-out menus. And in Photoshop, how do I learn, you know, the sub-menus? And in, um, in the plugins, how do I learn how to do all this stuff? Well, it's the same thing in music. You know, I have big hands. So I, I used to play Rachmaninoff, you know, the Russian composer. And the, these pieces were long pieces. And if I tried to do the whole thing, I learned the whole thing at one time, forget it, never do it. But if I did it measure by measure, I was able to learn it. So I tell people in Photoshop, learn curves for a week, learn levels for a week, learn blending modes for a week, learning adjustment layers for a week. And in a year, you'll know 52 things, which is way more than you need to know, right? That's a know. great plan. That's a great plan. Well, I love like that. Well, Anne Lamont has a great book. It's a book on writing, but it's also a book on life. And the book is called The Bird by Bird. And <clears throat> just quickly, uh, summarizing the, her philosophy is, um, this is before computers in the 60s. She and her brother are sitting at the kitchen table. Her father is, uh, is there. And the little brother has to do a report on North American birds. And he's freaking out. So, you know, he's, he's pasting the picture of the birds on the index cards and writing the stuff with the pencils. He's freaking out. So he says to his dad, Dad, how the heck am I going to do this? How am I going to learn all the birds? So the father turns to the son and says, Son, just do it bird by bird. So whether it's bird by bird, whether it's measure by measure, whether it's curves for one week and levels for one week, uh, or fly-up menus for one week, <laughs> the, you have to do it bird by bird. Great advice, Rick. So that's a perfect segue. Why don't you give us a bird? <laughs> Why don't you share your screen and teach us something? Okay, so what, what we're doing here is we're talking about, <coughs> excuse me, envisioning the end result, right? So <clears throat> the picture on the top, I created the picture on the top, which I'm going to show you how to do, uh, from the picture on the bottom. And the picture on the bottom is a snapshot. Now the top looks like maybe I did HDR, right? Mm, yeah, in black and white. In black and white. Well, the thing is, a train like zooming by me, so it's it's not an HDR shot. So there's a lot of things I wouldn't say wrong with the snapshot because we're just my wife and I are walking along uh, uh, one of the spots that we did on Route 66, which is a great trip, by the way. Going on Route 66 is just an amazing trip. But so we're walking the trains there, and I figure, okay, I'll take a shot. So then, uh, you know, I like to challenge myself. I think we all need challenges. I said, you know, what could I do with this? Because I, 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 I wanted to get a nice black and white uh, train shot. So I'm going to show you how quickly and easily I was able to do this, thanks to the power of Lightroom. No, I'm only kidding. Thanks <laughs> yeah, actually, Lightroom would really work well to open up the shadows on that train. <laughs> thanks to – so, uh, and by the way, you see my little logo there. I, I recommend to <clears throat> all photographers to get a logo. Uh, this really, I only got the logo about six months ago, but it, it changed a lot of things. People recognize the logo. So anyway, let me go back to, oh, so here's the original shot. So <clears throat> let me see if I can remember what I did. <laughs> so first of all, uh, now, by the way, I might do some things here. I might skip, skip some steps because I want to go, how much time do we have to do this? About 10 minutes. Okay, so you see I duplicated my layer. You never, as you know, you never want to work on the original layer. So one of the things that bothers me is that the uh, the pole that the crossing lights are on is like leaning in, right? But yeah. you know, the best photographer in the world shooting close up with a wide angle lens, this was taken with my Canon 17 to 40 millimeter lens on my Canon 5D Mark III. You know, if you took a shot and you're like on the ground crouching down, you want to get the sun in like that, which as you can see, I eventually cropped out. Uh, because I thought it was like distracting, the pole is going to be leaning over. So basically what I'm going to do is select all. I'm going to use the pull-down menus rather than the shortcuts so just people could see what I'm doing, okay? Great idea. And, uh, yeah, because, you know, we should learn the shortcuts. They're called shortcuts because they do save us time. But anyway, we're going to select all. So what's wrong with this picture? 
And usually I find, Jan, that if you ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? How can I fix it? The, the answer will, will help you find out what to do. So what's wrong? It's the perspective. So we're going to go to edit, we're going to go to transform, and we're going to go to perspective. Now, I'm sure there are people watching this who are saying, well, this is destructive image editing, right? Well, it might be destructive image editing, but I've made, I actually have a print in my book of this. It's almost a full page, and it looks just as good as the, uh, as the original file. So yeah, I moved the pixels around. But again, I picked a very extremely underexposed, extremely distorted picture just to illustrate the power of Photoshop and to give people the uh, encouragement to, you know, if you, get, if you get a picture that you don't like, think about what you can do. So I just hit return, okay, and I'm going to go control D select. So we, we fixed that. We fixed that up. So now what I'm going to do is I realize I didn't like the sun. So I do like these waves coming in here. So I'm going to crop it, and I'm going to hit return. By the way, <clears throat> to digress for just a minute, as I usually do, uh, Edward Weston, talking about the great photographers, Jen, that we were talking about, he had a wonderful expression. And he said, composition is the strongest way of seeing. And this is true, and that's why I think, you know what, I'm looking at this. I think I could straighten that pole a little bit more. Uh, uh, transform perspective. Composition is the strongest way of seeing. Uh, let me go deselect. And that's true. And I think all your listeners should be really happy they're photographers because they see the world differently than non-photographers and they, say th they see things that photographers don't see. I think so, that's true. And, you know, you don't have to do all your composition in the camera, right? I've, I know I've seen you talking somewhere else about something. I think you called it crop composition <laughs> or something. Right, that you well, make your composition afterwards sometimes. Well, that's true. Now, some people are against, uh, some photographers, pros, are against the cropping. But, you know, I think cropping gives us a second chance at composition. So I, I, I'm sure your listeners can <laughs> and your viewers can tell that I talk kind of fast. So in one of my seminars, uh, I am talking about, you know, composition and cropping, uh, and I, I'm talking fast because I want to get everything done. You know, I give presentations from 9 to 4 live. So that, you know, sometimes toward the end, you know, i got to speed up. Not that I'm running out of energy. I just want to speed up. So I said, you know what's really cool? Cropposition. So I came up with both of those. I That's came up great. with that term. So anyway, let's keep going. So uh, we're going to go here to the camera raw filter, uh, which, you know, in, in CC it's here. Was it in Photoshop CS6 too? I, I can't think it remember was. remember that far back. <laughs> I think it oh, was no. maybe. <laughs> so I think this camera raw filter is amazing. Now, now at this point, you could do a lot of the same things that you do in, uh, in, uh, in Lightroom. So what do I want to do? I want to open up the shadows. So, oh, I mean, this is pretty amazing to me that we could do this. I'm going to change, move my exposure. And whenever I adjust my exposure, I'm looking up here. I'm looking at the histogram. Now, when I'm shooting, not for a shot like this, because it was just a quick grab shot as the train was going by. Um, if I'm photographing like a bald eagle flying up in Alaska or photographing, you know, a model in my studio here, I'm always pushing that histogram to the right. And because most of the information, as you know, is over, is over to the right. So when I'm adjusting it, adjusting my, my exposure, I'm moving it over to the right, and I don't want to get a spike like you see here. So when I'm setting the exposure in camera, I'm doing the same thing. I'm moving it to the right, so I, I don't have any blinkies. Uh, so... Uh, which is, you know, the highlight alert or the overexposure warning. And I'm checking that histogram. So with just these two adjustments, I think, it, uh, you know, the picture looks a lot better. It looks a little flat, uh, just like an HDR shot. When you process a picture in Photomatix or uh, Nick HDR FX Pro, if you open up the shadows and tone down the highlights like I'm going to do right now, your picture is going to look a little flat. So this is why... A lot of people don't like HDR because the pictures look flat. So what I like to do is is boost the contrast. And you have to play around. You have to play around with this. One thing that really bugs me is uh, is overexposed highlights. So I really push this to the right as far as possible, tone down the highlights to the point where I don't have any uh, overexposed highlights. You love blacks too, right? Yeah, I love uh, adding in the black. Whenever I drag shadows to the right, I drag blacks to the left. It's like well, a rule. 
That's a rule. Well, that's I'm, my I'm, rule. I say. <laughs> yeah, I see. I'm I'm dragging it to the left too. And then clarity. You know, look at clarity. Clarity brings out the detail. You could see. You know, talk about destructive image editing. You could still see the pebbles down here. We're going to get rid of this uh, this uh, flare caused by the the sun hitting the front element of the lens uh, in just a second. But you can see this still looks uh, pretty sharp. Now the difference between vibrance and saturation, or one of the differences, saturation saturates like the whole thing, uh, the whole image. But what what uh, get this back? What uh, vibrance does is it saturates the pictures, the element, the colors in the in the file that aren't already saturated. So again, I'm envisioning this black and white picture. So I know I'm not done here, but I'm going to click OK. So here, if we just go back and look at my original, you know, there's there's what we had, you know, down here, and you know, just a few minutes. And if I wasn't talking, I'd be done and like having happy hour because it's 5:45. <laughs> I would have done that. So uh, let me uh, get. Okay, so we're not going to crop that. So now we were talking about plugins before. I'm going to Silver Effects Pro. Do you like that? Oh, my fave. Well, not my very, very favorite anymore because I also like Mac, Fun Mac Fun's Tonality Pro for converting oh. from color to black and white. But Silver Effects Pro by a different company, by Google and Nick, is also really, really great. It is really great. Uh, yeah, they, they, you know what people say, like, what's the best? I say, well, they all get you to the same place if you just know how to do it, right? Yeah, of course. You know. Uh, one thing, so anyway, how are we doing on time, by the way? Uh, five minutes. Okay, five minutes for the whole thing or five minutes for just this lesson? Because I'll speed it up like I do in my presentation. For the whole, so for the whole sharing of so, your screen. So I'm going to high structure, but high structure can also emph emphasize mistakes. So you see like a little spot of dust here, which I was going to take out. So my tip is when you're doing this, when you're playing around with these different uh, effects, when you're playing around, know that they can, like Detail Enhancer, like I said before, Detail Enhancer can definitely uh, uh, enhance all your mistakes, too. Which Big is what? That's, that's in Color Effects Pro. That's, in, that's in Color Effects, right, that's in another one. But I suggest when you're working in black and white, probably the most important thing after selecting a preset is to play around, or maybe even before, is to play around with the filters. We were talking about famous landscape photographers before. Ansel Adams loved the red filter. Look at what it does to the sky as opposed to just the gray filter, right? So, right, and people may not realize that those filter uh, buttons are meant to mimic putting a, a filter on your camera lens. So if you used to use a red filter on your camera lens when you were shooting black and white film, that would emphasize the blue in the sky. Exactly. So that's one of the advantages for being around as long as I have. I actually shot black and white Me too. Uh, film, right, with a view camera. With a view camera. So anyway, uh, by the way, this is taking a little while. Uh, this would happen a lot faster if the if the file was a, a little smaller. But now I'm going to go to uh, Nick Collection. I'm going to go to Color Effects Pro, and getting back to Ansel Adams, he did something that the Renaissance painters did. Uh, he darkened the edges to draw more attention to the scene. So there's what that detail extractor does. It doesn't look that good and the reason it's there is because I was using it last. But let's go to this dark and light and center over here. Uh, let's go to the shape. Put that right here. Let me go to the board of luminosity because I, I want the attention to go to this train here. And by the way, since we don't have enough time. I would go back. I see a little bit of a halo here, so I think I open up the shadows a little too much. So that's why we have that halo, which your viewers may not have noticed, but I would go back and not do that as much. But anyway, I'm going to hit compare here, and look how darkening the edges uh, draws more attention to that center subject. So I'm going to click OK, and you can see in just a little while we had, we have fairly nice image from a snapshot uh, and then I would use the clone stamp tool to get this out good yeah so I you know I know you have so much to teach and I would love to see more um, so if you have time we'll have you back and you'll show oh, us another tutorial I'd love it and I 
You're doing amazing things. It's great to see, you know, you're so productive. And, you know, I think, you know, getting back to instructors, you know, people want to know how much you care before they care how much, you know, your personality comes through in your teaching. And I think that's why you're successful as a, as a teacher, a fun teacher, because you make learning fun. Oh, you're so kind. Well, the same exact back to you. It's been a real pleasure to have you here, and I really have enjoyed to see how you use those additional plugins on top of everything that Photoshop offers. And that's something, you know, there's always more for uh, for people who are using these programs to explore, even when they think they know everything about Photoshop. <laughs> now they got the plugins. So it's cool. Nobody, I don't think the Photoshop people know everything about Photoshop. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start waving my hands soon, saying, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, you could do that. Well, thank you, Rick Salmon. I really appreciate you being on the show and loved your tutorial. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much for joining me for this episode of The Fix. It was really fun to talk to Rick Salmon and to see how he processes photos in Photoshop. If you want to see more of Rick Salmon's work, go to his website, ricksalmon.com. And don't forget to tune in next week for another episode of The Fix. I'll have another great guest for you and more tutorials here on thisweekinphoto.com slash thefix. Mm -hmm.